So now I'm really interested in what is the new picture, uh, the more accurate picture of how the GCD relates to the set S of all linear combinations of A and B. But let's just be really specific. I didn't want to bore you with doing it out live. But here's the process that we were getting to. The 28 is a linear combination of A and B, 44 and 152. 12 can be written as a linear combination as well. It turns out to be 16 times 152 minus 5 times 484. Now I'm not saying that these are the only this is the only way to make 12, for example. That's addressed a little bit later in the in the chapter when we're talking about finding all solutions. And there's some little bit tricky things there. I'll mention that again. But this is one way to make 12. And indeed, 2432 is this, minus 2420 is this, does make 12. Four, then, you can solve the equation we had before, come as a combination of 28 and 12. Well, that's a combination again of 484 and 152. So it turns out to be 11 times 484 minus 35 times 152. And you're going to get a lot of practice in doing exactly this process because it's what you actually do computationally to solve equations like this using the Euclidean algorithm. But the main point I wanted to make is that, in fact, G wasn't just something that's smaller than everything in the set S of linear combinations. It is in the set S, okay? And where is it going to be? Well, it's going to be right here. I claim it's going to be the G is the smallest positive uh, element of S. Let me just, we don't really need that little sidebar anymore. So if I look at all the positive numbers in there in S, then uh, certainly zero is the, uh, it's the closest to zero, and then there's negative numbers. But if I look at the smallest positive element of S, I claim G has to be that one. Because we know now that G is going to be, be able to be written as a linear combination. And the thing is, suppose G was up here. Okay. G, remember, is supposed to divide into everything in S. So S is all these guys, well, including zero. Okay. If G is going to divide into them, then I can't have anything small or positive in here because this would be like a half G or a third G or two sevenths G or something like that. So G actually has to be the smallest positive element of S. Okay. And notice, you might notice, have noticed that I'm writing S in a much more predictable way now, in regular spacing, okay? That's because we actually know a lot about S. Not only is the GCD of A and B the smallest positive element of S, I can describe S in a rather simpler way. This turns out to be, have massive generalizations later on in, in sort of more advanced algebra and number theory. Um, what did we define S as? It was the set of all linear combinations of two integers. And that's a little bit complicated because it is what we're seeing right now. They can play off against each other in interesting ways. Those numbers were really, were pretty big, three digit numbers. And yet we're realizing that you could play them off against each other just to, to get just four. Um, now we couldn't get one. Everything there was divisible by four, but you could get something fairly small, okay? And then, so my claim is that S is actually just the multiples of G just like g times z, say, where z is an, oh, I'm sorry, uh, these are integers, my bad, so correct that, x, y, or these are integer linear combinations of a and b, otherwise it would be rather circular. Okay, I claim that s is just exactly the multiples of the GCD. Um, and why is that? Okay, oh, I erased the one thing I wanted to save here. Remember, it was that g, in our example, now you might think, let me caution people, especially my students who are watching this. I'm not claiming I'm, ha I'm really proving everything super carefully here. That's what the book's job is. And don't get the feeling that you can prove stuff by example just because I'm giving some heuristic justifications by example. Um, I feel like it's nice and concrete, and I don't want to be too pedantic, but don't prove things by example, please. Um, but in this example, at any rate, we're seeing that... Um, that the GCD, in this case it was 4, was a combination of 44 and 152, okay? Now suppose um, I take any, and we know that, that anything in S is definitely divisible by this guy, okay? And I claim that any time I take a multiple of this guy, it'll be divisible. So for example, what if I want to know, is it really true that 13 times G is in S? Is that really true? Let's see, just because it's 13 times g, does that really mean it can be expressed as a linear combination of 44 and 52? Absolutely. Just multiply both sides of this equation by 13. 
So it's going to have coefficients 13 times 11 in front of the 484 and 13 times 35 in front of the 152. Okay, so this is a very powerful statement that instead of thinking of it as combinations of two separate numbers where you have to think carefully about how they play off against each other, it's just really just multiples of one number and that number is exactly the GCD. Okay, so this is what the book in the first section in 5.1, this is what the book uh, focuses on that, all right, it's, it actually is a special case we'll talk about in a second, but basically that the greatest common divisor can be thought of in a very alternate way, not as something that's like a, a piece of A and B that goes into A and B, but it actually can be made out of taking A and B and making and looking at combinations of those guys. I, I think this is a really profound fact. I remember being surprised by this and took, taking a while for me to figure out why did this feel so weird? It's because G, like I said before, is something that's supposed to be kind of smaller than A and B. It goes into it as a piece. And yet you take a bunch of bricks of size A and a bunch of bricks of size B, and somehow you think that would make something much, 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 much bigger than something that's inside of A and B. But because we can use negative numbers, it's actually playing them off against each other. And the book has a nice picture of this of like weighing scales with potatoes and things like that. Um, and by playing them off against each other appropriately, you can actually get down to the GCD. Um, so that's cool. Um, so another way to say this, remember there's this set S language, but then there's the solving equations language. And this is a huge deal if you want to solve those equations. Okay, so the corollary here, and again, I'm not trying to be super rigorous about the proof, because um, I was kind of resorting to examples and hoping that you see that the example generalized, but that's what I'm going to do. Um, the corollary is that the equation, if we phrase it in terms of solving linear Diophantian equations, ax plus by equals c is solvable. In other words, given a, b, and c as the input data, I can find x and y, and these are all supposed to be integers, but x and y can definitely be negative, um, in integers, super crucial. Uh, if and only if, or exactly when, G divides C. This is just a restatement of saying that the set S, which is the set of all the C's you can possibly get out of here, is just the set of multiples of G. Okay. Now, uh, connecting real quick, uh, without making this video too much longer, the book, for very good reasons, it focuses really quickly, it doesn't do this in exactly the same way, it focuses on the case where G equals 1 and is really good to really understand the case where g equals 1. In other words, a and b are relatively prime. And then go back to the case where they actually have a common factor. So this is, this is a little bit different from how I presented it here. So they would say ax plus b y equals 1 has a solution exactly when, well, when 1 divides, oh, sorry, a, a equals by, uh, I'm sorry, um, Hold that. X, B, X plus B, Y equals C. Oh, no, that's right. Exactly when um, the greatest common divisor is equal to 1. In other words, relatively prime. Okay. So they're going to focus on the hardest case of solving. It's really hard to play off integers against each other and get 1. And you're only going to get it to work if they're relatively prime, but you will be able to get it work if they're relatively prime. Then they go ahead in the later section, they, they put in um, a coefficient here that's not one and think about solving that. So it's kind of a two-stage process for them. Um, briefly, one other thing about how the book does it, and this is even if you don't have the book that I'm talking about for my course, you will probably see this proof um, very commonly for, the, for this fact. So the theorem that we've just talked about, I can't say I've given you a super rigorous proof of it, but I've, I think hopefully convinced you, um, is that the GCD of AB is the smallest uh, positive number in the set of linear combinations. And the usual proof is kind of a it's not very constructive feeling uh, version it uses um, the well-ordering principle. And it's a very slick proof. 
and definitely my students, you should take a look at that. It's basically, when you use the well ordering principle, it's really kind of to avoid a strong induction argument that's messier than you'd like it to be. You can turn what I was doing with the Euclidean algorithm into a very, very general, complete proof. It's just, it's kind of messy. You have to sort of say, well, that, that Euclidean algorithm might take a bunch of steps, and I'm not sure how many steps, and then you have to do this. It's, it's, when you ever have, have to sort of describe a procedure, it can get a little messy. And there's a way around that, um, which uses the well-ordering principle, and f focuses on the fact that, ooh, there's, when you have sets that have a smallest positive number, that's something that's very elegant. It's deeply tied to induction. If it seems a little inscrutable, it's because they're trying to avoid making what I just did super general. Okay. 